here we will learn about the challenges in financing renewable and infrastructural projects in developing countries for over 50 years. Please welcome Natalia to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is for you. And there's your clicker. to IFU, but first of all, let me say that I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the organizers. Um, I will repeat myself, uh, but I do it a lot. Um, it's one of the few occasions where I come to an environment where I really don't know anyone. Uh, many of the conferences that I have participated in resemble a kind of high school reunion where you meet people that you meet on any other occasion. So very happy to talk to any of you after the presentation because this is basically the, the purpose of me being here, getting to, to know the participants. Many of you know IFU as a small Danish TFI. I will go through the first five slides very quickly and I apologize for the stark difference between the slides which were made by our uh, communications department, which are nice and structured, and the ones that I made myself at the very end. So uh, IFU, a small Danish DFI, has been established in 1960s, um, actually one of the WTO rounds, which abolished a tax on coffee from developing countries, resulted in the pool of money from this tax being put into a fund in Denmark, called IFU, um, and IFU has over the years basically recycled the capital. Um, this means that we have paid back all the money to the government by paying dividends to them. The money has been invested in over a thousand projects in emerging markets, and the government still has assets for 3.8 billion euro. So you can say that it has been a good business for the government. They have recognized it recently and decided that why not invest in these markets again? Why not do it together with someone who already knows what they do in, in these markets? And this means that IFU will grow in terms of capital and um, personnel within the next seven years. It means also probably that IFU as such will not be called IFU anymore. IFU in Danish means investment fund for developing countries as it was introduced. But it doesn't really say anyone anything in English or in any other language. So we are looking for a new name. We have not decided what it will be, but it will be something different. Today, we invest in four areas. When I say invest, it means both equity and loans. Green energy and infrastructure is one of them. This is where I come from. Financial services, which today are investments in funds, microfinancing and banking. We are almost overexposed on funds, so it's very limited healthcare and sustainable food systems, which includes also forestry. <coughs> there are many colors on this map, but uh, the message is that basically we either invest in the poorest countries in the world or in countries where we can see that we can deploy considerable capital in the green investments, especially in green infrastructure and renewables. If you look at examples of, of what we have done over the last two years, it includes many countries from a very broad spectrum of what's possible for us to do, both in terms of tickets and, and geographies. We have a small facility for Ukraine that we keep on revolving basis and invest only from this facility in, in Ukraine. Otherwise, we either invest from our own funding our own funding being IFU main capital, or we have a number of funds where IFU is the fund manager, and then we have IFU as the largest LP, 
and a number of Danish typically pension funds as institutional investors um, investing from the same uh, vehicles. From IFO, we offer also loans. We don't do it from, from our managed funds. If you look at uh, how we invest, in terms of tickets, it has been increasing over the years. I think that if you ask anyone today, our sweet spot is around 20 million euro for equity capital, but we are a minority investor. So our investment hypothesis, if you want to call it this way, is that we want to be a significant minority, but we do not want to be the lead investor. This means that, for example, for Africa, we would typically lower the tickets, uh, chasing an equity ticket which is minority of 20 million euro can, can take a long time in, in, in some markets. Depending on what makes sense, uh, we also provide debt. These are not uh, maturities which are typical for renewable projects, I would say, seven to uh, five to seven years. But this is because most of our investments in renewable energy, which take the um, form of a debt, are mini perms, where we provide a loan to a hold co, typically somewhere else in the world, um, sometimes in the country where the asset is located, like Brazil. And then this loan, together with the sponsor's equity, is used to fund the equity requirement in the underlying projects. In both cases, we typically are present on the board, either as board member where we have invested equity or as observer where we are um, lenders. But in as much as we are not interfering, if you want to call it this way, with day-to-day uh, -day management of the projects, uh, we are an active investor. We make a value creation plan, we work on this plan with our management and other board members. So we would like to have an active say in the way the uh, investments are moving on. If we move to my two slides, I think the key learning has been that um, regulatory instability is the key risk. And many of the things that I say here are probably not new to you, but I think in one of the sessions earlier today, there was a question posed, how come that in an investment in Europe, it has taken 12 years to come to actual investment decision, whereas in our, our market, it would only take three. It's because if you are a developer and you have to struggle with constantly moving timelines, new taxes, new permissions, and so on, this takes really uh, an age to, to come to, to the actual financial close. So if we see that the environment is stable, that there is a, a regulatory framework which is maybe not the best in the world, but we know what it is, we can adapt. If, if, the moving, if there is a moving target, then it takes really a long time and typically also costs to, um, to get there. So stability and predictability of the regulatory framework is the key. Whether we invest in projects which have full offtake or partial offtake, that, that's not uh, the most important factor here, but, but the stability is. If you look at what are the elements of successful financing in, in renewables, um, as I said, we are typically a second largest investor in these projects. Um, it can be that the original developer is there. It can be that they have exited at the time of financial close. But we also have another developer who has brought the project to where we typically invest together, unless we have helped them also on, on this side of things. And it's important for us that they have skin in the game. The alignment of interest uh, in the investment group is really something which comes as the very, very second, uh, if not equal, important element in, in the 
um, decision to, to invest. Another question is making sure that the equipment for the project, whatever is the CAPEX, is procured in a transparent way, in the transparent way, not only because we want to know where the things are coming from, um, trace them back to wherever they can be uh, traced back, but also in the sense that uh, we are fine with our co-investors having other commercial interest in the, in the uh, projects that we do together. However, it's also important that we get the best equipment, that the performance of whatever is built on site is what we um, can expect as best in class. In many countries, we have learned that uh, the order of merit, the ability to curtail certain technologies in favor of dispatching others can be a poison to your investment case. So this is another of the consider considerations that, uh, that we have. Unfortunately, if we are in an investment in many, many years, this can also change. A country can change uh, its priorities based on what costs most on their system rather than uh, what it did 10 years before. Confirmation of renewable resource. This is, again, one of the truisms, but um, I think another truism that I will say here is that the weather these days is getting more and more extreme. Um, we have seen a lot of uh, climate disasters over the last decade or two. But one thing, if you look at the um, graph from an actual real life situation, is that we are also in a low wind era. So today, if this is a measurement from Brazil. The flat line is showing how the wind speed normally should be. And then the blue and red lines, these are two separate studies showing how it actually is. So if you are unlucky and you, and you have made your wind measurements starting where the wind has started going down, it means that your results have been largely overstated. It means that what you will get as an operator of a wind farm will be probably worse than what you have uh, projected. And this has to be also put into your investment um, simulations. When it comes to ESG considerations, I think that we have always viewed that ESG is one of the risk mitigation elements as any other. Working with communities, because they are host communities, is in itself a rewarding and important aspect of, uh, of any uh, investment. But we can also see that uh, rather than create gentrification of certain groups which are privileged to find work with uh, a project, especially in situations where we have several ethnic groups competing in a nomadic uh, area for, uh, for the resources in the area. It becomes a game of not only engaging in, with these communities, but also an important aspect of making sure that you basically engage with them on equal basis, that nobody is privileged over uh, anybody else, because in many of these communities who have been probably historically in conflict over many years, it will create only, only further uh, disagreements. Um, we would prefer, as probably any external investor or lender, to have a fully wrapped EPC. Unfortunately, try to get a fully wrapped EPC in Malawi probably will not get you far. So there are markets where, although it is industry standard to get EPC in a solar project, there, there will be markets where it's not possible. Then it becomes a dilemma of you as an investor. Do I want to push the impact of a 
of energy generation from a renewable resource without an EPC with the, um, with the risks it bears, with the interface problems it can create, um, or would I not make the project at all? This brings us to control over the timelines. If you don't have an EPC, you can also end up in a situation where the project, for example, is too big or for any other reason cannot take the transmission line um, construction under the same um, project or the same capex as uh, construction of, of the main plant. And you can sympathize with local government who doesn't want to build a 430 kilometers transmission line ending in a lake where there is nothing there. And then you can sympathize with a developer who wants to build a 300 megawatts wind farm in the middle of nowhere and they need to have transmission line to actually be able to sell the electricity. It can create issues on basically both projects waiting for each other, both projects having to coordinate the timelines, having to coordinate uh, actions around very trivial things which are part of any uh, construction, like compensating crops when you build the transmission line from the farmers who are located along the uh, construction. And the last item is never save money on consultants. And please don't overuse it when I say it this way. But it is important that when, when we get assessments, we get them from parties who can stand on what they say. We have very, very seldom triggered compensations for something which was simply not right. But at the end of the day, the quality of your consultants is not only translating in the quality of the reports you get, it also translates typically in the quality of the liability that the consultant is taking for whatever they say that is right. I will stop here.